Hello everybody, how's everybody doing out there? Welcome to Tuesday, 28th edition of Living Life. You know, I used to live in New York City, and in the summertime, when we all used to ride the subway, people used to really sweat and perspire. And I don't know how it is over there in Korea or different cities, but when somebody is sweating in 100 degree temperature, and there's no air conditioning in the subway, like in New York on some of the trains, people start smelling. And so when somebody sits next to a person that kind of smells a little bit, they tend to kind of move to the side and scoot on over to the side and kind of try to stay away from them. The interesting thing is I've seen similar things, maybe not that uh, clearly, but I've seen similar things in the church. I've seen some people come, sit right next to somebody perhaps that they don't know, and for one reason or another, I've seen church members kind of scoot to the side. Now, why does that happen? I would think more if somebody sits next to you because you're a brother or sister or you're a family in Christ, that you should actually even scoot closer to that other person as a family member in Christ. Well, there is a certain thing that we are seeing here in the text of Hebrews where people are starting to rub each other wrong and start having some factions. And what the text of Hebrew is telling us today is that we ought to love one another and embrace one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's take a look at that as we go into our Living Life devotional today. Hebrews 12, verses 14 to 29. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, Once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words, once more, indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, 
for our God is a consuming fire. You know, as we come into the text today and we are focusing on Hebrews chapter 12, 14 through 29, once we start reading some from, starting from verse 14 on, we do see that there are some issues that are going on here with the Hebrews. The author is constantly trying to highlight the fact that there are some issues going on within you guys and it is not Christ-like. Let's read uh, verse 14 and 15 real quick. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy without holiness no one will see the Lord see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many you know what's going on here in this community well for sure one thing that we do know is that in Hebrews the author is addressing Jewish converts Okay, people who had a, you know, a background of being the people of Israel, Hebrews who are coming to Christ and who is accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But in the midst of it, they're coming to realize how difficult it is to transform from being a Hebrew to actually now a Christian. And all the difficulties of identity, all the difficulties of reversing many thousands of years of tradition that they're used to, and now becoming a new community under Christ, they were having various difficulties in that. And therefore, some of the uh, Jews were trying, they were tempted to revert back to Judaism. And the author is trying to encourage the community to stick together and stay together. I'm sure that some have already left. And sometimes when you go through difficult times and you're a part of community and people start leaving to other places, some people get discouraged and they could probably hold some kind of bitterness. They could even be calling each other names, calling them traitors. We don't know what is exactly going on, but we know that there is trouble. And one thing that um, the author of Hebrews is clearly explicitly lifting up to the community there, the Christian community, is to make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. And without this holiness, no one will see the Lord. You know, one thing that I wanted to highlight, especially as we are people who go to church on a weekly basis, and if you're not, I'm hoping that all of you guys desire to uh, keep the Lord's Day, you know, uh, holy and continue to go to church on Sundays. But one thing that uh, I'm coming to realize is that oftentimes people mistake us being Christians in church and Sunday worship to just be vertical, meaning myself, and God, and as, I, as long as I worship God, that is the only thing that I need to do. You know, that is halfway complete. You know, the Christian faith has to do with your worship to our God and your relationship with God, but also it has to do with the horizontal as well. Not only do we need to uh, revere God and connect with God, we need to connect with one another. And it is very clear. And let me tell you, I would say in my life, it's easier as a Christian to connect with the Almighty God who is gracious and kind and loving and compassionate than with other people because we know that in human relationships, our flesh oftentimes gets in the way. And here is the author of Hebrews saying, hey, your flesh needs to dissolve with the love of Christ. And the love of Christ needs to come into you and you need to start affecting the community, lifting them up, loving them, and really building them up. As we see in John 13, 34, 35, Jesus says this, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I mean, Jesus made it very clear and simple that as his disciples, one of the things that we must do it's not an option, it's whether we are at church or whether we are anywhere else. As believers, with one another, we need to love, we need to care, we need to lift one another up. And also we see the same type of encouragement coming from Paul here in 1 Thessalonians. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, I, uh, just as, uh, just as in fact you are doing. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. So this is one thing that is um, highlight front and center that the author of Hebrews is encouraging the community here um, to do. But not only that, we see uh, very clearly that as they are being discouraged 
with their sins and with their weaknesses, that they're not really having confidence in Christ. And I see that a lot of times. You know, as human beings, you and I, we're all weak. And when we come before the Lord and we ask God to forgive us, we kind of sometimes think, man, how many times are we going to keep asking God for forgiveness? I'm not going to reproach Jesus anymore. I'm just too weak. I am too wicked. You know, I think sometimes we think this and we don't approach God with confidence. But one thing that is uh, for certain as a believer is that once we are saved, we are always saved. And as long as we believe and we trust in Jesus Christ, I know for sure that with whatever weaknesses that, you, that He desires for you to continue, come to the cross in confidence, knowing that you are forever protected and loved and connected because you believe in Jesus Christ. It says here uh, in verse 22, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirit of the unright uh, uh, spirits of the righteous made perfect. You know, understand that in confidence you can approach the living God. And I want to close with this quick story, and that is, you know, um, just recently we started a worship, uh, you know, our first Sunday worship uh, for us. And, um, you know, it's January, you know, beginning of the new year, and many Christians want to do their best, you know, in coming out to church. And I've been encouraging all my friends who, have been going, who haven't been going to church for years, and I say, hey, come, you can make a new impact in the new year. 2014, let's continue to seek God and start making our church worship consistent. And they're coming to me and saying, no, I don't think God could forgive me. I don't, I don't know. I haven't gone to church in such a long time and I haven't been seeking God. What makes you think that God will accept me? And what I say to him is, are you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that He has forgiven you of your sin? Do you believe that He has redeemed you? And they say yes. And said, so then whatever weaknesses that you have, God will continue to work with you. It's up to you to come and approach the Lord with confidence because His heart doesn't shake. It doesn't go in different places. His love for you will const be constant and He desires you to continue to come and seek His face. So there's a couple of things that we um, highlighted here today in our devotional. And the first thing that I really wanted to encourage you is that understand that um, you're, you are not just an individual when you go to church that's seeking God and Him alone. There is one thing that God desires for us to do. And He desires for us to not only love God, but love the community of God forgiving them, bearing with them, loving them, and continuing to have this fellowship, encouraging one another, developing one another. And you could only do that if you are interested in God's people. Now, I know a lot of Christians who are interested in Jesus. I know a lot of Christians who are interested in God. But are you interested in your brothers and your sisters as a family? That is a question that I have. And if you are, my question to you is how, how deeply are you connected to them? You know, oftentimes it's easy for us to go to church, do our thing, check our list, and go out and have no fellowship. But that is not a way that the Lord wants us to experience our Christian living. So, if you are not, if you're just going to church and you're just connecting with God and not with your brothers and sisters, I have a challenge for you, an application for you. Join a small group. Join a small group. Because that's the only way you will really be able to um, share life and do life. You know, sometimes, especially when we go to big churches, it's hard for us to connect with people and live life with people. But if you go intentionally to a small group and you start getting to know your brothers and your sisters and you're getting to know their life and their circumstances and their situations, then you can actually pray for them. You can start doing the real fellowship that God desires for us to have. And then that, uh, next, one thing that I want to go on ahead before I close is to encourage you guys to um, know that if you guys haven't been going to church for a long time or you feel like you can't approach God in confidence, that God is open arms for you right now. No matter what you have done in 2013, the Lord is willing to forgive and give you a fresh new start in 2014. So I really encourage you guys, don't let the, the, the things of the past or 2013 hold you back. Approach the living God who is willing to take you into His arms, 
to bless you, come to Him, and have a fresh new beginning in confidence, knowing that Jesus Christ will accept you. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for just another fresh new year that you have given to us. Lord, it's already close to the end of January. Now pray, Lord God, that you will bless each and every one of my brothers and sisters who are out there, who desires to live a fresh new life for you. Loving you, Lord God, seeking you, but also loving and seeking our brothers and sisters, really uh, communing with them, fellowshipping with them, loving them, and lifting them up so that our community would be a solid community of Christians and that we would be empowered and that we would also be able to go out and make a mark for this society and for this world. So bless us today as you have, uh, have given us the, the wonderful word. Allow us to really be empowered by that and go out and live a life that shines the light of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.